Views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. But they should be. Those aren't the views, but they should be. Should be the views of everybody. James over here with you with Micah Robertson. We're doing a special What Does the Bible Say? Worth the Lord joint session uh, tonight. We've got the tent up at the Eden Fairgrounds, and we hope that you will make plans to go out and visit. Uh, if you're watching TV, we're glad you're watching the show tonight, but we wish that you were out at the tent. But uh, nonetheless, we hope that you will make plans to go out having uh, very nice weather, mm -hmm. Micah. Very and, enjoyable. Uh, uh, just couldn't ask for any, any more. The Lord really blessed us in that regard. And so, uh, you know, it's very pleasant to be outside and uh, be in the tent. And it's even uh, more pleasant when we can study God's Word together, which is what we're doing. So uh, we've been door knocking this week, Micah. Um, how you, um, uh, what, what are your impressions of door knocking? I mean, how's it going as far as your perspective? It seems like this year has been our better year overall in door knocking, uh, not just in Eden, but even in Danville. I and mean, I was very surprised with the Danville door knocking, how pleasant people actually were and how easy they were to talk to this year. And with the door knocking this year in Eden, there are more people that are willing to, to actually stop and have conversation with us. And uh, I've had several uh, visitors every night right. uh, so far with the tent meeting here in Eden. So exactly it's, right. uh, it's a very exciting time. Yeah. I, I, I don't know, you know, I don't know what it is, but it may be that we, we're kind of slowing down a little bit. Right. You know, we're just, we're really uh, trying to take our time and mm -hmm. try to find individuals that, that will talk. And so, but, but nonetheless, we've still uh, uh, knocked out about 3,000 flyers mm -hmm. uh, as far as doors we knocked on. And so uh, we're still, we're still not slacking. And so we may be coming to your area and we have already come to your area. Uh, look around on your house because you may be one of these people that go in the side door and right. we put something on the front door, but there may be a flyer on your door. And, uh, you know, uh, really what we're trying to do, friends, is we're really trying to get people to come out and study the Bible. Uh, let's find a unity that, that God wants for us to have. All the confusion, one of the flyers that we're uh, putting up is uh, the ad that you saw in the uh, Eden Zone Journal. If you didn't see that, uh, go get an Eden Zone Journal and uh, find one. We're talking about the confusion. All, the, all these different churches that are uh, f going around town, I mean, they do all kinds of different things mm -hmm. and all profess to be doing it with God's uh, blessing, but God is not the author of confusion. So why is it that uh, we can't get along? Why is it we can't use the Bible as, as God wants us to do? And that's what we're trying to get down to on the tent. And you know, James, we're not prejudiced with our door knocking either. No. We're, we're going all over that's right. the city of Eden. That's right. Uh, hitting, you know, hitting high, hitting low. I mean, you know, rough, uh, rough areas where people probably wouldn't go. Right. We're, we're going to those exactly areas right. too. We're just, we're saying, here's a map, you know, you take this section, we'll take this section, and pretty soon we'll do it all. So, uh, as a matter of fact, Micah, in the, uh, on the wall in the in the auditorium at the church building, mm -hmm. you know, we have maps from past uh, tent meetings. Right. And, you know, we, when we finish, we'll put it on the wall. And, yep. and it's like we've got, you know, there's five or six maps up on the wall of places where we've been. And so you can take a look, and, you know, we pretty much covered Eden every year. Right. And so uh, we hope that you'll, you'll make plans to come out and visit with us, friends. We really are your friends. Uh, Come out and find out if what you've heard about us is true. Because a lot of times people give us a bad rap. So y'all just a cult, stirring up trouble. Uh, I talked to a gentleman today, and uh, that's what he says. His family all caught, says we're cults, and he says, "But you know what? I'm right there with you, listening to you." And and so uh, we hope that he hope that he's watching tonight. He wasn't at the tent, mm -hmm. so and he says he never misses a show. Right. So uh, you know we're still looking for you, my <laughs> friend, and uh, hope that you'll come out and visit with us. So uh, well, Mike, what we what we got planned tonight? Well, tonight, you know, James, this is a this is a topic that I know that we have hit on and hit on and hit on, and people are probably tired of us hitting on it. But to be honest with you, I'm tired of the fact that people keep keep bringing it up, right? Because it makes, I mean, if if you really stop and think about it, what we're going to be discussing tonight really makes Bible discussion a burden. Right. It makes it very tiring. It makes it very toilsome when people start trying to dive into their experiences with the Holy Spirit. I mean, actually, Tuesday night during during my sermon, had a woman raise her hand during during the during the sermon, and wanted to try to start talking about the the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit moving with her, and you know, trying to question us as to whether we believe in the Holy Spirit or not. Friends, we believe 100 percent in the Holy Spirit that the Bible talks about. Right. But that's the problem. When we're reading about the Holy Spirit in the Bible, it doesn't match up at all with what we're seeing in the religious world today. Right. 
And when we start dealing with these people and their experiences and their emotions and they're not, you know, they're letting their emotions and their experiences run over the Bible. And when you, when you get into that kind of conversation, like it was underneath the tent, it kind of just ends up going round and round in a circle because they're wanting to hold on to their experience and not listen to what the Bible right. says. And you know, and, but that's really how, but that's really how we're going to get down to the bottom of it. It's have right. those kind of discussions. I mean, the lady asked a question and that, you know, we, we say we welcome questions and so that's fine. But the bottom line is when we, when we have discussions, you know, we have to be willing to concede that, you know, something that we're saying may not be true right. when we line up with the Bible. And so that's what we're exploring tonight is um, what, what Mike and I were discussing. This is kind of the, the crux. This is kind of the, the foundation, the fundamental, uh, the keystone of a lot of this discussion on the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's what and, we're going to get into tonight. And it's kind of the keystone to a lot of the division that we have. Exactly. You know, going to what you said about the flyer and the confusion that's going on in the, in the religious world. A lot of that confusion, if I can, you know, tongue in cheek here, can be blamed on the Holy Spirit. Because right. every single person that starts a church or starts a new, or, new organization, what they're going to start with is, well, God spoke to me. Or the mm. Spirit came on me and, you know, moved me in this direction. This is just the way that God was moving me to, you know, to, to go with my life. And it, it always ends up being in a contradictory form to either another system or that which is talked about in the Bible. Right. So if we, I, you know, James, I, and especially, I mean, it's amazing to me, and, you know, we're going to get into this in just a moment, how, how this movement of the Holy Spirit is actually bleeding over into other denominations where it once was not was not at all prominent. Right. I mean, we're actually going to talk about some Baptists tonight right. that are moving over into this spirit-driven, away from the Word, this spirit-driven and spirit illumination that was usually just held to with the with the apostolic holiness and charismatic movement. And really, that's that's the problem that everybody has. Uh, you know, Michael, when when you start getting away from the Bible, then you're you know you're getting away from the pattern. Mm -hmm. And so that means pretty soon things start changing, and you don't really see them changing until you look back and go, man, look where, where right. we've come. Right. Look how far we've drifted, mm -hmm. and that's really what we're talking about. So I think we're going to start off with uh, a, a short video clip of, uh, who is this? Mr. Larry Luffman. Larry Luffman, uh, Freedom Baptist Church in Martinsville, Virginia, and uh, listen to what he has to say about the Holy Spirit. And um, this, like I said, this is kind of going to be the, the, the key... Uh, problem that we're having. So let's listen to what he has to say. Lord, may we pray. Father, I ask right now that the Holy Spirit will illuminate the scriptures for the entire body today. From God, I have never... Man, that was quick. You want to do yeah, it again? Yeah, do it again. Never heard right. the audible... Lord, may we pray. Oh, sorry. So I, I said... I'm excited there with my button hit. Lord, may we pray. Father, I ask right now that the Holy Spirit will illuminate the scriptures for the entire body today now that the Holy Spirit will illuminate the scriptures for the entire body today. All right, so he's praying. So that, I sit down with my pastor. He's praying that the Holy Spirit will illuminate the scriptures for the entire body. That's the entire people that, the, that, are, that are assembled there. Now, friends, this is, you know, that, that may sound, that may sound normal to you. Right. You know, that may sound, well, that's, 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 what, that's what you should pray for. Uh, but this is, you know, this is uh, in the Baptist manual. Now, do you have that, we have that sure picture do. pull up? I do. Because we don't, we don't want people thinking that we're misquoting, misrepresenting people, but this is, this is actually a quote from the, uh, the, uh, the, Baptist, the Baptist faith and message, I believe is what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Can you read that? I can read that for us. Uh, section C of the manual, God, the Holy Spirit, it says, The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. He inspired holy men of old to write the Scriptures. Through illum illumination, he enables men to understand truth. He exalts Christ. He convicts of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. He calls men to the Savior and affects regeneration. He cultivates Christian character, comforts believers, and bestows the spiritual gifts by which they serve God through his church. He seals the believer unto the day of final redemption. His presence uh, in, the, in the Christian is the assurance of God to bring the believer into the fullness of the stature of Christ. He enlightens and empowers the believer and the church in worship, evangelism, and service. And there are a list of verses down there that I'm guessing would, they would try to use to uphold their position. Right. Now, now the, the, the statement that we want you to really focus on is right there. It's so like the second or third sentence. Right. 
The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. Don't have a problem with that. Nope. Don't have a problem with that. He uh, inspired holy men of old to write the Scriptures. Don't have a problem with that. Here's the problem. Through illumination, He enables men to understand truth. Now, friends, if that's the case, if that's the case, we would like to know how it is that we find that out in the Scriptures. Right. All right? How do you come across this idea of illumination? Uh, the Holy Spirit illuminates the Scriptures. That means to enlighten or helps you understand the Scriptures. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know, you know, Mike, I didn't really uh, uh, search in my concordance for illumination, but I'm, I've read the Bible through, and I'm pretty sure I've never stumbled across that. But Well, if we want to do uh, it for the people, I've got my Bible program here. Right. And we can just we can search it real quick all and, right. Luma and make sure I can spell it properly. Because I know that will play a factor. No versus matching search criteria. Try removing words of which you are unsure. Well, well there's Hebrews. Um, I have Hebrews 10.32 says, But call to remember the former days in which, after which you were enlightened to endure a great flight of affliction. Uh, I don't really think that's uh, referring to the uh, illuminating of the scriptures. Uh, I believe it's the idea of um, uh, your... Uh, see, the, the context here is for, We know him that hath said, Vengeance belong to me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God, but call to remembrance the former days in which after you were in, illuminated, ye endured a great flight of affliction. So, uh, seems to be, you know, at one point when God revealed himself or revealed his will to them, that might be uh, the illumination referred to here. But it's certainly not a direct illuminating of the individuals, which right. is what our our religious neighbors would would hold to today. So uh, we get we have this question. Then we have this question: What is Holy Spirit illumination, and what what does it do? We, all we really have is is their definition of it: the Holy Spirit illuminates and helping people to understand the Scripture. So, uh, Mike, I just right on the first, I start having problems with. That statement. Uh, what? Let's 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 talk this through. What could help the community to understand the problem with this? If the Holy Spirit is supposed to illuminate the Scriptures for us today to help us understand it, mm -hmm. um, my first question is, uh, how do I know that? Tell me, tell me how, what you know about the about the about the Holy Spirit. Well. The only thing I know about the Holy Spirit is what I can read about in, in the Bible. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're, you're reading about the Holy Spirit in the Bible. Right. Now, but how did you understand anything about the Holy Spirit from the Bible? Well, I'd, am, I, am I arguing from their position or am uh, I arguing yeah, from my position? Yeah, well, I guess, yeah, arguing okay. from their position. Well, from their position, I wouldn't be able to understand what I read about the Holy Spirit until the Holy Spirit came and enlightened me. So the Holy Spirit had to enlighten you so that you could understand that the Holy Spirit enlightened you. Right. So even then, you know, I'm, I'm following where you're going. Even before, I, wouldn't, I would not even know that it was the Holy Spirit enlightening me. Right. Because I have nothing to, I have, How, no, I have no grounds to base it on. Right. How would you know that you were even, even enlightened? Right. So we're supposed to read, we're supposed to be enlightened by the Holy Spirit, which you've never heard of, because we can't understand the Scripture that tells us about the Holy Spirit because we haven't been illuminated uh, yet. See how that works, friends? It is so confusing. We were going over this after afternoon, and Michael said, do you have a chart for that? You know, <laughs> it's like, friends, I, if I had a chart, it would be so convoluted and so twisted that I don't know that we could follow it. There'd be arrows going all over the place. It, it would be. It'd be like... Uh, you know, I don't know what to call them in, uh, 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 around here, but in, in uh, I think in uh, Atlanta they call it the Spaghetti Junction, all the, inter all the traffic, mm -hmm. you know, the interstate and everything mm -hmm. mixing crosses it. That's what it would look like. It's like, which way are we coming? Let's say this again. In order for the Baptist doctrine, illumination of the Spirit, to be true, then, friends, you would have to be illuminated by the Holy Spirit, which you have never heard of or never understood until you read the scriptures which you wouldn't even know happened to you until you were already illuminated. See that? So, in other words, you're being illuminated by something you never even heard of. 
How did the first person come up about with this illumination stuff? I have, I mean, I, I would have, I have no idea because, like you're saying, I'm they're waiting on the spirit to illuminate, but yet he's illuminating information that he's never learned before. So where did he even get this idea right. of illumination? Right. Because if the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit helped you to understand, how did you know you needed the Holy Spirit? Right. If you could not understand the scripture. Right. See how that works, friends? That's why when someone calls and asks me about the Holy Spirit, well, how do you have the Holy Spirit this, Holy Spirit that? I'm saying, well, tell me something you know about the Holy Spirit that you didn't learn from the Word. See? It really reminds me of those folks in Acts 10. Mm -hmm. You know, when, uh, when Paul comes up and he's, he's talking to them about have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed, and they said, they said what? We don't know where there be any Holy, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. We have not so much as heard where there be any Holy Spirit. We hadn't even heard about the Holy Spirit. We don't know what you're talking about, the Holy Spirit. Yet, they had been being told the word. Did, did the strong. folks in Ephesus, had the folks in Ephesus been taught something about the word? Uh, they sure had. According to verse 1, it came to pass. Um, that, that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul had passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. Well, what's a disciple? But somebody who was a follower. Right. Somebody who had been receiving some type of teaching. In verse 2, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard where there be any Holy Ghost. Then Paul asked a question. He asked, said unto them, Under what then were you baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. Okay, now, let, let's explore this a little bit. So John's baptism... Well, it was from God. Right. I mean, can we look at John 1? Sure can. And uh, let's start about verse 4. In the beginning was the Word, the Word with God, the Word was God, was God, all things created by Him. Uh, let's look at verse, uh, verse 6. There you go. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. All right. And what was his job? Verse 7. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. All right, keep going. So he was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came to his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God, the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and was beheld, and we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, so John was sent from God to tell, to talk about the Christ that was to come. Now, when the folks in Acts chapter 19, when the folks in Acts chapter 19 had been taught what John was teaching, they were being taught a message that was ordained from God. It was authorized by God at one time. Absolutely. Now, did did the folks uh, did the folks that were listening to John did they have the Holy Spirit did the Holy Spirit illuminate them I mean that's a good question because if that's how it works now that see friends that's what we're trying to do we're trying to work this out by going back and studying the Bible and looking at characters in the Bible and finding out how it played out for them and it's you know James I'm reading this. And if it is the case that you're supposed to wait for the Holy Spirit to come and illuminate, then what's Paul doing here? Right. Why weren't they already illuminated before Paul even came? Well, now let's, let's, look, let's look some more about John's, John's message here. In John 1, verse 33, John 1, verse 33, John is going to be saying, he's going to be talking about uh, how he was going to know who the Christ was. All right. Can you read that? I sure can. Verse 33, And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptized with the Holy Ghost. So, so the folks that heard John, they weren't baptized with the Holy Ghost. Right. Yet they were having, they were, easily understanding his message because mm -hmm. they were all going out to be baptized with John. Right. 
So my point is the Holy Spirit wasn't illuminating the people who heard John. And then you have folks in Acts 19 who heard the same message that John was preaching, albeit it was, it was no longer valid. Right. And they didn't know about the Holy Spirit. You know, so... So they, they really should have been prime candidates yes, for this illumination. You would think. You would think. They oh. were like the, the pre-illuminated. Right. Uh, you might say. I mean, they are. I mean, if you basically are looking at it, they're they're clean slates. Mm -hmm. We have not even heard where there be any Holy That's Ghost. Right. So, and there, you know, there again, if they've never heard of any Holy Ghost, then guess what? They have not heard either about this illumination. You know, they're not at all sitting around waiting, expecting this illumination to come. They're just right. kind of they're just kind of out there roaming around doing their own thing. Right. Right. So, uh, so, so this is what we're we're saying, friends, about this this illuminated business. When, when, when Mr. Luffman and others are saying, you know, we're going to pray for the, the, the Spirit to illuminate the Scriptures for this group of people, well, here's a group of people that were listening to John, and they weren't illuminated. They, they, were, they were getting a message that was from God, and nothing was even said about illumination at all. Mm -hmm. Now, you mean to tell me that Jesus comes along, and he's got the Holy Spirit, we just read John 133, the Spirit's going to descend upon him and remain. And Jesus is going to be teaching people. And, well, now that I'm thinking about it, Micah, I don't know that the Holy Spirit was uh, uh, illuminated any of the people that heard Jesus teach. Now, here's what I'm thinking. John comes along teaching, and his disciples, his, his audience is not illuminated mm -hmm. to understand the Scriptures, to understand the message from God. So... If Jesus, if the message that Jesus is teaching now requires someone to be illuminated, to me that sounds like John's message was a little more, a little simpler, plainer than even Christ. See, Christ, you need you to understand, you have to have help from the Holy Spirit to understand Christ's message. But John's, no, John's is all right. That's a, I believe that's a fair assessment. You know what I'm saying? I think that's very fair. I mean... If that is what it's taking today, and that's, okay, Jesus was teaching then, Jesus is still teaching now, we still have his word, but yet people, like people are saying today, well, I need Jesus' word to be illuminated. Well, Jesus' word must be, must, just like you said, must be much more difficult for us to get a grasp on, but I, mean, I don't think anybody would go that, I don't think anybody would really say that, would they? No, but they would have to. Yeah, they would. I mean, they'd have to, if they were honest, they'd have to take that conclusion. Mm -hmm. You know, Mike, this is what I'm, and I don't want to get off on this tangent here, but it just no, it's fine. Let's, it let's always makes it. me it makes me think, you know what, when men start getting things backwards or start adding things, they always make God's plan worse. Uh, you know, this idea of, of um, which, I'm, like I said, I want to get off on, on born in sin, but it's like we've always said, when you say born in sin, then and you read you read about the, the, the cure for sin mm -hmm. is the blood of Christ. Right. Well, Born in sin makes the curse stronger than the cure. Right. All right. It makes it makes the, the curse of sin so strong that even the blood of Christ can't remove it. Right. Well, now, now we have well, now we have the message of Christ having to be illuminated that it previously didn't have to be illuminated. Mm -hmm. So, see see what we're talking about, friends. This is why we look at these things. And we're trying to help you to see that these these doctrines of men or these things that are in these catechisms and these creed books and so forth that that uh, uh, bring about these little special uh, doctrines, all they're doing is they're actually twisting or resting the scriptures to your destruction. And so uh, that's why we're exploring these things. So, uh, which, you know, this, is, this was another thought on this, on this illuminated business. And uh, we may be kind of getting out of order on some of the things we no, talked about fine. here, but... Uh, I asked you about this uh, this afternoon. You know, the same people, the same man that, that prayed that the whole the whole congregation be illuminated, uh, he would teach once saved, always saved, right? He would. Yeah, we actually have him on record uh, discussing with one of the members uh, from here, or whether from Eden, uh, talking about his dad who's now living in adultery. And he actually made the statement, if your dad truly is a saved person, is a child of God, then even though he's living in adultery, he wouldn't be lost. Hmm. Now, so let's think about it. So once saved, always saved. That they say once saved, always saved. Now, why would this man need to be? Would he need to pray for the whole assembly to be illuminated? Because 
let's think about this. If you're saved, what would be what would be required in order for you to be saved? You argue from the from the baptism. What would what would you have to do? What would you have to understand in order to be saved? In order to be saved, you have to understand the word here. Right. So yeah. you would have to have been illuminated in order to be saved. Right. Now, if you were already illuminated in order to be saved, well, wouldn't you stay illuminated? I mean, with and that's, you know, friends, this is, this is how you have to reason these things out. And when you begin to reason these things out, you begin to realize how ridiculous the stance actually is. Right. Because, like James said, if you're illuminated at the beginning... And everybody says that, you know, you talk to anybody today about the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I've got the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's living in me. Well, mm -hmm. then that statement right there ought to stand that, okay, if the Holy Spirit's living on, in you, then you ought to be continuously illuminated. Right. So and you, you shouldn't have to have, you shouldn't have trouble misunderstanding the Bible. Right. Yeah, you shouldn't be led off into adultery. That's exactly right. You shouldn't be led off into anything. And, and, and you certainly, of all things, you shouldn't have to, Go ask your preacher for a verse, or right. don't not, not know where a verse right. is. See, it all it all ties in together, friends. This idea that if you're if you're illuminated, why not one, if you're once saved always saved? Why not once illuminated always illuminated? And so and now, uh, let's back up for a minute on this too. Now, if you've been illuminated, in order to know what to do to be saved, or illuminated in order to be saved. Well, does that mean the Holy Spirit illuminates a sinner? There again. You know the Holy Spirit's coming up on a sinner? I mean, right. That yeah. would have to be that have to be the logical conclusion. Yeah. I mean, you cannot be saved reading it alone because you can't understand it. You've got to be illuminated first before you can understand it. So therefore, you've been illuminated before say, being saved. Yeah. So the Holy Spirit is illuminating the lost person. Now the all of it, and of course, now you understand what we're, when we say this, friends, we're saying that is what your doctrine is teaching. We're not saying that. No, we're just not trying to help you come to the conclusion that, hey, if that's what you believe, you know, you're going to be all tied up, twisted up, and tangled up. Mm -hmm. All right. So, but yet we have preachers that would say. Well, you know, the Holy Spirit's not going to come into an unsaved person. Can we, can we play that? Uh, I, I didn't give you this. Okay. It's on there. All right. Uh, I give, give it a little time to pull that up. It's This is uh, from, I think, 2005, maybe, Jerry Carter. Dr. Jerry Carter over here at Regional Baptist Church. We had a, uh, we had a debate uh, on salvation, but he brought up this idea of, of, the, of the Holy Spirit illuminating. Or, well, he didn't say illuminating, but it was the idea of the Holy Spirit illuminating. Uh, the relationship that a saved and un unsaved person has with uh, with the Holy Spirit, and so I want you to listen to the one play the the, the longest one. I don't know which one it was. Okay, that one's the six. one says Saul. Uh, okay, and I saw that. Yeah, you know, just a uh, just a moment here. That's just a little end of it. This is about a minute, and a half or so, minute forty. Okay. And uh, listen now. Listen to what Jerry Carter is going to say. If we get this to play. And I think we can look at the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter number 9 to where, the, where he got saved on the Damascus, Damascus Road here. In verse number 6 of Acts chapter number 9, it says, And he trembled and astonished, said, Lord. Now, he, we see here that he called uh, Jesus Lord. And if you'll notice that Judas never called the Jesus Lord, he always called him Master because he had never believed. Well, if you take your Bibles and you turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, Real quickly here, chapter number 12 and verse number 3. Uh, make sure I get it here. It says, Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus, uh, excuse me, by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus a curse, that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Right? So that must mean that Jesus, I mean, Paul called Jesus Lord, so that must mean that the Holy Ghost was already living in Paul, or Saul at the time, that he got saved here. And then if you look at verse number 9, it was three days later 
before Saul, or as we know him, Paul, before he ever got baptized. So we have the conversion of believing and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, as he called him Lord. And as we see there in 1 Corinthians 12, in verse number 3, there is no man can call Jesus Lord except by the Holy Ghost. And we know this, that the Holy Ghost does not uh, come into any person that is not saved. Uh, he just doesn't do that. Now... You know, he said, and it, he said something I just, I've heard this, I don't know how many times, <laughs> but I just now caught him saying this. Back up about the middle way through it, and I'll see if we can okay. say it again. And I think we can look at the Apostle Paul, call with Jesus a curse that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost, right? So that must mean that Jesus, I mean, Paul called Jesus Lord, so that must mean that the Holy Ghost was already living in Paul, or Saul at the time, that he got saved here. Right. And then so, so the Holy Ghost was already living in Paul at the time he got saved. Mm -hmm. But yet he just says the Holy Spirit does not enter into an unsaved person. Right. So at what point does the Holy Spirit illuminate someone to understand <clears throat> that they need to be saved? Because we've got one preacher saying the Holy Spirit will not come into an unsaved person, yet you've got another, uh, you've got the Baptist uh, uh, teaching over at the Baptist Faith and Message that says you have to be illuminated by the Holy Spirit to understand the message. So how is it that the Holy Spirit illuminates you to understand what you must do to be saved while at the same time the Holy Spirit is not coming upon you because you're unsaved. I just don't understand that. It's like, I don't know if I can make an illustration. It's so silly. Well, I mean, it's, and he's, he put himself in a predicament because how is he going to know to call Jesus Lord except for being illuminated? And he made the statement towards the end that the Holy Spirit never indwells an unsaved person. Right. But he had to be unsaved before he could call him Lord. But he's not going to know how to call him Lord until the Holy Spirit comes in him and illuminates. Who's on first? This is like an Abbott and Costello routine, right. you know, this, this whole uh, illuminated thing. But that, and that's what I'm saying. That's, it's like you've got the Holy Spirit doing one thing for you, but on the other hand, the Holy Spirit won't do anything for you because you're unsaved. Right. That's like I say, well, Mike, I'll, I'll help you out with your, with your car if you're a member of the auto club, but I won't help you out... Uh, you know, unless you're a member of the auto club, but you're never going to be a member of the auto club unless I help, I help you out. You, yeah. So really, I'm well, just stuck. I'm never, right. I'm never going to be a member of the auto club because you're stuck walking. Yeah. Because and that's you know that's where these people are. They're stuck in sin. So, see, friends, this is the, this is why we're saying there's so much confusion going on, because no one really opens the Bible and says, you know what? That's the problem. If this is true, then that can't be true, and no one wants to be told. Something's not true. Mm -hmm. So then we get all this tangled, uh, you know, intertwining, uh, conflicting, uh, false doctrine, you might say. In which, I mean, you know, you didn't want to go into it, but, but James, when you really get down to it, born in sin is the problem. Born in sin, being totally hereditarily depraved, is the root of this, sub-root of this division problem. When you have people that are supposedly born in sin, so depraved that they cannot understand the Word of God, mm -hmm. then what are you going to need? Well, you're going to need this illumination. But if you open the door for this illumination, then you're then opening the door for people to abuse it. Right. Which, again, it's not doctrinal at all. You're not going to find this illumination taking place. But then, but once you get this false doctrine out there, people start realizing, well, I'm already so, so depraved, that's one strike against me. So now, what's the big deal if I go ahead and abuse this man-made system? Mm -hmm. And that's really what we have going on in the religious world. I believe a lot of preachers are, are understanding. I believe they, they see it, that all of this is just a bunch of hocus-pocus smoke and mirrors. And they're now using this game to their advantage. Right, because they can, they can work on people's emotions, hype them up, whatever, you know. Scare uh, them to death. Yeah, yeah. I mean, exactly right. when I mean, just the idea. I mean, you stop and think about that for a moment. If you're a person, an average person that's sitting in the pew, and James, I mean, pe people may may think this is a, a harsh assessment on our part, but friends, this is one of the things that helps us in doing these TV shows is door knocking, and the things that we're going to say while we're on TV. We know you're not studying your Bible because we come knocking on your doors. Right. 
we come knocking on your doors trying to have Bible study with you, and we know you're not studying your Bibles because you can't give us book, chapter, and verse what you're doing. Now, you take that person that we knock on their door, they don't know their Bible, and they're sitting there in the pew, and the preacher's telling them, man, I'm getting, I'm getting nudges from God, I'm getting messages from the Holy Spirit, I'm just filled with Him, then guess what that means for the person sitting in the pew that doesn't know anything? Well, I better not cross him. Right. You know, he's, he's God's anointed. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. need to speak against God's anointed. Right. And it scares the people to death. Yeah. And even to the point where if a preacher, you know, from the show that I did last night, for a preacher to say that he's not going to bury a, a, a member of the church there because she was back, you know, she didn't, she didn't keep up with her tithing. Now that is, now, I mean, James, that's a lot of power mm -hmm. for one person to have. Right. And, sure enough. And it's just, I mean, they're just abusing it. Yeah. And so what you've done is you've created the system that has created these monsters, you right. know. And now it's like now the, I, I don't know, you know, that's like Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. You know, now Frankenstein's terrorizing right. everybody because you didn't, you know, you didn't stick with what you knew the, the Bible says. So, And, you know, James, that really is the key. I mean, we're, we're going through a study on Wednesday nights in Martinsville on the Holy Spirit. And we've gone back into the Old Testament to, to view the different places where the Spirit of God or the Spirit of the Lord is, is mentioned and the different things that He, he was doing. And, and friends, He is a He. It's when, when we hear people talk about the Holy Spirit, James, I mean, it, just, it almost sounds like He's electricity mm -hmm. or something. Right. But you know, they talk about the Holy Spirit like it's an it. It's just something that moves you. It's just something that's better felt than told. But yet, when I'm reading through the Bible and I'm noticing the Spirit of, of the Lord, Spirit of God working, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost working, He's doing things. And the fact that He, he is able to speak, He's able to guide, He actually is able to love, you can, um, oh, the word just, uh, word just left me. Uh, you can quench the Spirit. You can quench the Spirit. You can uh, be a hindrance to the Spirit. You can, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a word it's not, in, it's not to make him indignant, but it is the idea of making him upset. Right. You can not agitate. Provoke. provoke. I'm, no, uh, I still don't think that's the word. Okay. But Grieve. Grieve, that's it. Thank you very much. You can grieve, grieve the, spirit. the spirit. Now, can you grieve electricity? Does electricity become grieved you know, with, with people? No, it doesn't. It's just, you know, it's just moving through, through wires, minding, you know, I was going to say minding its own business, but it doesn't even have, it doesn't even <laughs> it have a mind. mind. That's right. But yet, the, you know, the Spirit of God knows, I mean, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit knows the mind of God. Mm. So therefore, he's, right. he's able to have knowledge. So, I mean, this, this whole idea of, I mean, the, the denominational world has completely construed what the Holy Spirit is to begin with, that it's no wonder people are so messed up on it. Right, right. Well, Mike, one thing, well, first of all, do you want to put the phone, do you want to put the phone lines up? That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, Matt, go ahead and put the phone lines up if you don't mind. We'll just open the phone line and uh, normally this topic uh, gets some discussion, and so that's fine. Uh, what about this, Micah? I mean, let's go ahead and try to uh, maybe explore some of the things that people will say. Okay. You know, uh, can we talk about, what, 1 Corinthians 2? Okay. Okay. Uh, in verse 14, one of the things that, uh, you know, we, we try to, um, when you're studying with people and you're finding out where they're coming from, you find out what they teach, what they believe, then it's beneficial to go back and, all right, let's, let's answer this or show them, find out where this is incorrect by showing that it contradicts another scripture, you know. So the Jesus said the scripture cannot be broken. So we know, that's John 10, 34, and so we know that if something is in out of harmony with the Bible, if it, if it doesn't add up, it contradicts, then we know that, that that's wrong. So individuals will say certain things, and so we want to be able to, to give those an uh, answer. All right? Before we get into that discussion, let, we'll go to All this right. phone call. Good evening, caller. You're on What's the Bible Say? Yeah. Is, it, is the Holy Spirit a third person? Well, as as far as do you mean? I mean, he he is referenced oftentimes as the third person, but of course, when you're dealing with the Godhead, when you're dealing with divinity, they're actually all equal. They're actually all on the same level. So it's three people in one. They they possess a divine nature. I think that's where that's where we uh, we kind of we kind of misunderstand the Godhead. Uh, we're, we're talking about a divine nature, all right? Just like um, if I said, 
uh, you, caller, and Micah and I, we all possess a human nature. All right? We're all humanity, right? But we're different, but yet we possess that one nature in common. Uh, how are we doing? Is that all right? Yeah. In so, other words, what you're saying, a person has a godly spirit, shows it in a godly way. No, I'm saying that, I'm saying that we are alike. We all possess something, one thing in common, and that is we are human beings. So we have humanity. We have a human nature. Right. And, but yet we're different people. Right? Okay. You clearly know that Micah and I are different people, and I know you're a different person because you're on the phone. So, but yet we all have a, a uh, we, are, we are all human. We all have humanity. Well, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all deity. They are all divine. But yet, they're all different. They're separate individuals. So, Instead of being human, they are divine, and that's why we say they have a different. They have a different, uh, different personality. They're different individuals, but they all possess a, a divine nature. All right, uh, I'm thinking of. Uh, Michael's looking at something there. I was going to. Uh, uh, in Acts, uh, 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 go ahead, go ahead, caller. Something similar to uh, you hear people talking about all the time, uh, the, like the Trinity. Yes, there's three. In other words, Trinity just means three. But what we're talking about is we're talking about three persons or three personalities, right? Three <clears throat> that, personalities that, and that, one person. That all have a singular nature. What, what if there were only three human beings on the face of the earth? There were, there, if there were only three human beings on the face of the earth, they all three would possess a singular nature. That's correct. All right, they'd all be humans. They'd all be human, but they'd all have different, yeah, personalities okay. and spirits, you might say, right. or attitudes. Right. Now, watch this. Now, with, with God, with the Godhead, we're talking about three persons, but instead of being human, possessing a human nature, they possess a divine nature. Now, in, in uh, 2 Peter 1, verse 4, 2 Peter 1, verse 4, Peter says, uh, Whereby are un, given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. That's the same word as Godhead. Mm -hmm. In Colossians 2, and verse 9, <coughs> Colossians 2, and verse 9, all right, all right here it says, for, for in him dwelleth the fullness of, of the Godhead bodily. Now you can say in him dwelleth the, sorry, but I'm getting in, in the way. In him dwelleth the fullness of the divine nature bodily. Christ, Jesus was the only one of the Godhead to have a body, but yet he still had a divine nature as well. And that's why he's able to be our Savior because he understands the human nature and he understands the divine nature. He's a he's God man. He's a man God. First uh, Timothy two and verse five. There is one mediator between God and man. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. Between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. The man Christ Jesus. So uh, that's but that's why we're saying the divine nature and human nature. It's it's we're trying to use those comparisons so you can understand that the Godhead. Is a is a is a deity. So you have the the Holy Spirit is deity, Jesus is deity, and the Father is deity. I think a lot of times, Michael, the, the confusion comes we, when we talk about the Father. We say God, God, yep. And then we say Jesus, and we say Jesus, yep. But really, Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and God is God. All right, they're all. When we say God, we're talking about deity. Okay. And, yeah, it gets rather confusing there at times. But, uh, a little bit there to a point. Right. Well, I, I think it gets a little confusing there to a point there, but I was trying to figure out how the person, when you have that Holy Spirit. Well, well, when you say you have the Holy Spirit, what do you mean by that? Let's define some terms here. 
I'm not really sure what I've heard people say about the Holy Spirit. They had the Holy Spirit, so I'm trying to figure out what is it exactly they have. Is they they have a godly attitude, or they act in a in a way, or do they have some kind of special powers? Well, that's a, that's a good question. That is a very good. That question. is a very good question, because and and here's why the here's why we ask that is because when when most people tell me they have the Holy Spirit. They have. They want to say they have some special power, mm -hmm. something mystical or special or whatever. And so the first thing I then say is, prove it. You know, demonstrate it. And so uh, I, I think if if someone asks you, caller, if someone asks you uh, or tells you they have the Holy Spirit, then I would say, what do you mean? You know, get them to define what they mean by they have the Holy Spirit, and then. If they say they have some gift, which mo a lot of people are going to say they have a gift of tongues, they have the gift of healings, discerning of spirit, whatever, I'd say prove it, demonstrate it, and that's that's a that's a biblical response to uh, to what they're saying. When the apostles, the only ones who actually had the Holy Spirit that was given to them. Well, I think I think again one of the problems <clears throat> that we're we're, we're 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 talking about terms here. They were given a gift from the Holy Spirit, and right. yeah. which which were miraculous, miraculous gifts. Uh, in the Bible, you have you have phrases like the gift of God, uh, or the gift of the Spirit. Those are always miraculous. Uh, I mean, that that's just that's just all. There's, where, where, where are you, uh, Michael? Well, I'm, I'm looking at Acts two thirty eight right here, and it says, "And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost," and the, the language that's being used there, this is actually used in the possessive tense. That is that these are gifts not of the Holy Ghost. That is that the gift is the Holy Ghost, but the gift belongs to the Holy Ghost. Right. So it's the Holy Ghost giving out these gifts to, these, uh, to the apostles and then the apostles laying hands on different individuals so that they then could have the gifts. So the gifts would have been the speaking in tongues, the miraculous remembrance, the miraculous healings, uh, the discerning of spirits, it's not going to be the actual Holy Spirit itself. Right. Now, now, Carter, here's, how, here, here's, right. How, here's how we can know that. Here's how we can know that. Is, all right, uh, Acts 2.38 says to give the Holy Spirit. Now, let's go to Acts chapter 8. Let's go to Acts chapter 8, and let's look at verse 13, starting verse 13. Okay. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized... He continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Now what are they going to get? See, this is, the, this is the thing. All right, they're going to get the Holy Ghost, but what do they really get? All right? That's, that's what I'm wanting to know. All right, well, let's read on. Verse 15. Who, when they were come, uh, verse 16, for as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. Now look at who verse. Who is this Simon? Simon is is someone is a Samaritan who had obeyed the gospel. All right, this is not Simon Peter. This is uh, someone who's obeyed the gospel. But now look at this verse. This is a total different Simon. Yeah, this is not this is not Simon Peter. This is Simon the sorcerer. All right. Uh, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Simon yeah. the sorcerer. Simon right. Mangus. Right. Now li let's listen. Now look at verse twenty. All this time they've been talking about receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. Receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now look at verse 20. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou thought, thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. So this is not actually the Holy Spirit. It's actually a gift from God. That he was trying to buy. Yes, yes. He was trying to buy the, 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 the gift that had been given to the apostles. That's right. That's right. And, now, And he got himself baptized, 
and he wanted to be an apostle. Is that correct? Well, something like that. He, start, he certainly wanted some preeminence. But let's figure out what these gifts are. Let's look at one more verse. Let's look right. at, uh, go to uh, Acts 19. We were already there. Acts 19 and verse uh, 5, I guess, 5 or 6. Now, notice this. This is, the, when we're talking about the gift, what is this gift, the Holy Spirit, gift that's, that's given through the laying on of the apostles' hands? Acts 19. Did I say 19? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Acts 19 and verse uh, 2, Paul said, Have you received the Holy Ghost? He said, Have you received the Holy Ghost? And they said, No, we hadn't even heard of it. But now notice this. Come on down to verse 5. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. So, they didn't get the Holy Ghost himself. They got miraculous powers that were provided by the Holy Spirit. Because notice, they, they, yeah, yeah, they spake in tongues and prophesied. See, so it's always these miraculous gifts that are kind of, uh, uh, what, put for the Holy Spirit. The Holy mm -hmm. Spirit, it's called getting the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit was actually in... Uh, uh, I, I, maybe in the form or in the uh, yeah of of these miraculous gifts, the gifts were were what were were given, not the Holy Spirit Himself. Correct. Yeah, the gifts from the Spirit. Yeah. Right. The Spirit. Okay. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I understand that part. Of it. All right. Yeah, that, that that kind of explains it a little bit. Dick. Sometimes it gets confusing, but you really have to stop and think about it, and you have to. Continue to read, and you have to continue to read, and you have to read it sometime over and over before you ever get it. You get it into your head exactly what's going on. This Simon who was trying to buy this Holy Spirit and powers, whatever happened to him? Well, I don't know. He was told he needed to repent, and uh, he said, "Pray for me." Acts uh, eight, about verse twenty-four. Uh, twenty-four. Uh, then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of Samaritans. So well, he, he, apparently he repented and, uh, of, you know, of his thought, and that's really all we know about him. So uh, any, anyway, okay. well, did that help? Caller, did that help? Yeah, that, yeah it did. Okay. That just means I'll just have to go in there and do a little bit more research and read it. And uh, work this out in my head. Okay. I appreciate I appreciate the information a whole lot. Okay. Bye. All right. You on what does the Bible say? Did you pull up First John four twelve? And it says, "No man has seen God at any time." And I'm gonna hang up and let you explain it on the air how somebody. Hadn't seen Jesus. Thank you. All right. I don't know if I understood the question. Well, I think he might have been trying to build upon what we were saying about Jesus being deity, and so he's okay. trying to use that in a collective, in a collective term. Okay. And so, which I mean, at, at this point in First John chapter four, let's see here. Let me go back a few verses so we can make sure we get get the context here in uh, in here. And this was manifested the love of God, verse 9, toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and His love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in Him, and He in us, because He hath given us of His Spirit. Well, I would say, first thing, you know, right off the bat here, James, when John is writing this letter, nobody would have seen Jesus. He would have already been ascended. Right. So there's one possibility as to what he's referencing here okay. when he says no man has seen God at any time. Well, these people that John is writing to, they weren't there when Jesus was walking on the earth. Now, okay. at the same time, in this context, we have the different names or the different persons being identified. You have God being separated from the identity of the Son, verse 10. Herein is love that we love God 
but that he loved us and that he sent his son. So there you have two people being mentioned. God and the Son in the same verse. Mm -hmm. So when it's referencing God here, it must not be talking about Jesus because that would right. be called the Son right. in the context. So it's obviously referencing God the Father, right. which with that being the case, then that is true. Nobody had seen God the Father right. at any time. Right. And so and that, that too helps you understand John uh, 14, John 14, uh, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Mm -hmm. If he had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Well, wait a minute. How have you seen the Father? Well, you've seen him through Christ. All right, now look at this. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices us. And Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and ye have not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he worketh the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. So, in other words, Jesus is saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father because the Father is working, was working through Christ. So in that sense, you could see God. You saw, you saw it manifested uh, through the works that Jesus did. So, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know how to explain it other than I can, you can see somebody in something they do and not actually see the person. Um, well, Jen, just an example of that, my grandmother just got into town. She, okay. She's from Texas, and so she came up here for the tent meeting. And one of the things that she said to me as soon as she saw me, I mean, I've, you know, I've started doing my hair cut a different way, and the reason why I do it this way is because that's the way my granddad did it when he was young. And she came up to me, and the first thing she said to me was, you look just like your pappy. Now, I'm not physically, literally, my pappy. Right. But because of the way that I'm doing my hair, and then she even said some of the... She said uh, she, she remembers at times me coming into their house and me sitting down just like Pappy did. And I'd come in, sit down on the couch, and my hands would just go right behind my head just automatically. That's how he would sit. And she, would, she said, you look just like Pappy sitting that way. So when she's seen me, which right. I'm, I'm a completely different person than my Pappy, right. but in the, ad, you know, the characteristics and the actions that I take, she's seeing Pappy. And so if you've seen, if you've seen Christ, then you've seen the Father. And that's why then, let's go back to Colossians 2, 9, when Paul says uh, about Christ, for in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Uh, uh, th that's what we're talking about. You know, Christ is the, the manifestation of deity. So you can't see God in his, in his pure state, you know, in his glory. I mean, even uh, uh, Moses was not allowed to see his face. Right. Even though the Bible says they talk face to face, he didn't see his face because no man can see God and live. So that's, you know, you have to understand there are some, uh, uh, you know, figures of speech or, mm -hmm. you know, things like that that are being used because, I mean, God's writing the, bu the book in such a way that we can understand it. Right. So we without, having to, without having to be illuminated. Right. <laughs> exactly right. So no need to be illuminated because uh, God's writing it for us to understand. So, oh, hope that helped. Hope that helped. Yeah. And, you know, you know, James, I think part of it, too, is when we're using these terms deity and divinity, what we're describing, friends, is their, is their attributes, what makes them God, what makes them divine, and what makes them deity, the fact that they are omniscient, they're omnipotent, mm -hmm. they're, the idea that they're all-knowing, they're all-seeing, they have always existed, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about divinity and deity. You see, that's what makes the Father divine. He's always been. He's always able to see. He's always able to hear. He's all-knowing. He has all power. Mm -hmm. that's, what make Je that's what makes Jesus deity or the Word deity. He was the Word before he was Jesus. He was there from the beginning, and he is all-knowing. He is all-powerful, and he is omniscient. The Holy Spirit, what makes him deity? He has all the same attributes, attributes that the Father has and that the Word has. Therefore, right. they all have the same attributes. They're all all-knowing. They're all all-powerful. They're all all-seeing. They're all God. Right. 
because they're they're in that Godhead. And what made and what makes Christ so special to us is that He gave up some of that in order to to be our Savior. Uh, can we look at Philippians two uh, and like verse five okay. and following? Because uh, to me, Michael, I, I just don't think people realize <clears throat> uh, the, uh, the the sacrifice that Christ made. Right. Paul said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He didn't think it was something to be held on to. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't something that he just, you know what, I, I just can't live without this. I can't, I can't give this up. So what happens to him? But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So Christ, or the Word, as he was in, in the beginning, the Word was equal with the person that we say is the Father right. and the person that we say is the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And yet he said, you know what? I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to submit myself to an equal, which was, we say, the Father. Mm -hmm. See? He was equal, but yet he said, I'm going to submit myself because why? Well, he had to in order to be the Son. Mm -hmm. Now, can you imagine that? You know, let's think about from 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 standpoint, there's a lot of men that don't want to humble themselves. They, right. uh, you know, we're equals here. You mm -hmm. know, I get it from, uh, you know, kids all the time. You know, you're, you're not my mama. You're not my right. daddy. Right. You know, you're not my boss. You know, we're, we're, we're both kids. You know, we're both children. Mm -hmm. But Christ says, look, I, I, I'm i willing to submit for the sake of mankind. And I'm going to humble myself and submit myself. And that's why uh, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, 24 maybe. Uh, then comes the end when he shall deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father when he shall have put down all rule and authority and power, for he must reign till they put all enemies under his feet, and the last means to be destroyed shall be death. Now, come down to verse 27. For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him. So, Christ is all authority given me in heaven and earth with the exception of the Father. Mm-hmm. Why? Because I submitted to him. And I think that's why, you know, people don't realize the sacrifice that Christ made. He, he was, something changed in him forever. Mm -hmm. He's the man, Christ Jesus. Right. He's man God. Now he's, he submitted to become part man. And that's, you know, that's be, uh, uh, a sacrifice, you know, to say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm totally changed in some way to give up something. So, uh, and to think about it too, you know, the, the realm of the realm of heaven, the fact that here we are on earth, we're striving to go to that place so as to never leave it, but yet he left it behind right. so as to make it available for us to go. Right. And that's just, you know, that's that's a, you know, the, the thinking is kind of backwards. I don't want to leave heaven, but yet Jesus did so as to come here so that I could go to heaven. Right. And and so you know, that, that's what we're saying when we're talking about deity. You need to realize that, you know, the, the, the Word, the Father, and the, uh, and the Spirit, they're all equal. Like, like Michael said, they all have this divine nature. It's just that one of them said, I, I'm going to submit to this role for the sake of man. Now, I, I just don't know how to, how to say any more, you know, how, what, what great of sacrifice. We talk right. about Christ died on the cross. Right. He did more than die on the cross. Right. You know, there's a whole lot more to that sacrifice that that this person of the Godhead made than just coming down down the cross. Right. I mean, he 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 changed himself. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just like the I don't want to oversimplify or uh, I, I don't know what degrade the sacrifice that Christ made or, or belittle it, but it's sort of like you know the 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 soldier that throws himself on a bomb for the everybody else, mm -hmm. well, he's totally changed. He, he may live through it. Right. But he is he is forever going to be scarred and changed, whatever. And so, 
uh, and needed great sacrifice, but yet still at the same time still did. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how we 